Hello and welcome again to the next instalment in the Beyond Python Intermediate series. In this five-part mini-series, we're going to tackle threads from zero knowledge assumed to being confident using them knowing when and how to use them, and also knowing when not to use them. We will take a different approach to most, in that we'll focus on using threads and understanding the syntax in greater and greater examples, and then filling in the detailed knowledge towards the end after we've coded and have a scaffold on which to hang facts. There are two modules in Python with which you can use threads, the underscore thread low level threading API and also the higher level threading module. In program code you're almost certain to use the threading module at the higher level, however we're going to start off in this episode with the underscore thread low level threading API because it's easier to use for the simplest examples, and it will give us some hands-on experience after which we can tackle the threading module. Here you can see the Python 3.8 documentation for both. As you can see, the underscore thread module has far fewer methods. Threads are notoriously feared, but if you follow these five parts, you will know the difference between threads, processes, multiprocessing, the components of concurrency, queues, executor pools, and any of the other language associated with concurrency. Let's jump straight into some code. Let's open the interpreter, import underscore thread as thread to make it easier when typing, and import time. Here we're creating a counter function that takes two arguments, id and count. The second line of the function iterates over the number that we supply in count. So if we supply 10, the code inside the for loop will run 10 times. We'll print an f string. In f strings, code inside curly brackets are executed as statements. So what will be printed is the value of id, note that this is the first argument we pass into counter, then an arrow, the value of i, and then we'll print a new line. Time.sleep1 will pause the program for one second, and we're doing this to simulate work done by a program that would take one second. To run this code, what we'll do is make another for loop for i in range 5, and then we'll use the value of i as an input to call our counter function, and by passing in 5, our program will count from 0 to 4. As you can see, what is happening is that our program is counting from 0 to 4 with a one second pause between each count and doing this five times. To see the difference that threads make without assuming anything about them, we'll run our code again with a slight difference in the for loop. Instead of simply calling our counter function, we'll start and run five threads. One thread for each group of 0 to 4 counts. In other words, each value on the left hand side inside the square brackets will act as one thread. The way we pass our function into start new thread is the first parameter is our function to be called, and any arguments are passed in as a tuple as the second parameter. So if you recall, we're passing in i and we're counting to 4 each time. What you see now is wildly different. We still have the counting from 0 to 4, but the length of time the program takes to run is vastly reduced, because each set of 0 to 4 counts occurs simultaneously. In other words, it's apparently concurrent. Concurrent meaning running at the same time. With our assumption that the time.sleep for a second is mocking some processing time, we can see that our program was processed in essence faster, much faster. Note the value in the square brackets on the left hand side. It looks odd. An unusual aspect of threads is that the output of the five threads run in parallel and is therefore intermixed. They're all running in the same process and what you'll notice is that the order will change from run to run. Repeat this yourself to see what I mean. All the threads in your program share the same global memory space. If one thread changes a global variable, that change will be seen by every other thread in your program. On the flip side, this is one reason why thread programming is so feared. 
if two threads change an object at the same time, one of the two changes will be lost, or the object can be silently corrupted. Locks in thread programming are how we get around this. Threads can acquire a lock for an object, and then while that thread has locked the object, other threads cannot change the locked object. Other threads will only be able to change that object once the thread releases the lock. Python ensures that only one thread can hold a lock at any point in time, so when the other threads try to request it, they are blocked until the lock becomes available again. In this variation on our program, we've defined mutex to be thread.allocateLock. Once we've allocated a lock in this way, we can run the acquire method or the release method to acquire and release the lock respectively. We've arranged this around the print statement so the print statement won't be interrupted anymore. Let's take a look at what output we get when we run this program. The output looks similar to our first variation of this program when we weren't using threads, so taking time.sleep to be a proxy for processing time, even though we've used threads, the total time taken for this program to complete is the same as when we weren't using threads at all. So we've introduced complexity without performance gain. This is why, in the next set of tutorials, it will be so important for us to consider when it's appropriate to implement the added complexity of threads in order to make sure that we get the maximum gain for minimal complexity and that we aren't using threads futilely and causing ourselves a headache. Let's take these concepts a bit further. Besides avoiding collisions, thread module locks turn out to be surprisingly useful, and we can use them as general thread communication devices. In the next example, we're going to use a global list of locks in order to know when all child threads have finished. Bear with me, this code ahead might look a bit complex, but we'll talk through it together. We're going to use the same lock that we had around the print statement, but we're just going to rename it to standard output mutex. The added element in this example is exit mutexes, and we're going to assign to that variable a list comprehension, thread.allocateLock for i in range 10. In order to understand this list comprehension, let's consider the code another way. For i in range 10, so that is 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way to 9, we're going to create a thread.allocateLock object. So the result we'll be left with is a list that contains 10 thread.allocateLocks, which are called. The one alteration to the counter function is that after the for loop, we're going to acquire a lock at the index value of the ID in the list. To start our program, we'll create a second for loop for i in range 10, and then we start the new thread. Remember, the first argument passed is the function we want to call, and then any arguments we pass as a tuple as the second argument. And when we run this, we see counts to 99 from naught for 10 threads, and the thread number is in the square bracket. And as is the behavior we expect, the threads aren't going in order of naught, one, two, three. They are in a random order for all intents and purposes. The purpose of the next piece of code is to ensure that our counter function has reached the last line, which is to acquire the locks that have been allocated in exit mutexes. If in your interpreter you write while true and then a colon, and then within the while block you put a pass statement, you will see that the interpreter will just wait and you won't be able to input anything. That helps explain the next piece of code. What this for block is doing, it iterates through every item in exit mutexes. If the mutex i.e. the lock that's been allocated in exit mutexes is locked the behavior that we expect at the end of our function, it will be true, and because there's a not before it, it will be false. So the while block will not run. So our interpreter won't hang and we'll be able to print main thread exiting. If, however, our function hasn't run correctly or hasn't run at all, then the locks that we allocated in exit mutexes 
is will not be locked. So mutex.locked, the second line in the for loop, will be false. The not before it makes it true, and so while true, the pass statement will run, and we won't have access to the interpreter to be able to print the main thread exiting. If we reset this program and allocate the locks in exit mutexes, then this is as if we're at the start of the program and the locks are released, they haven't been locked. So if we run this for loop with the while block, we won't be able to print main thread exiting. I hope you've enjoyed part one of this mini series on threads. We have four more parts to go, and by the end of it, your breadth and depth of understanding of threads in Python and concurrency in general will have moved on leaps and bounds. Please do like and subscribe if you've enjoyed this material, and spread the word so that others can enjoy it too. See you next time.